Hello everyone, I'm the Reverend Dr. Derek McQueen, pastor of St. James Presbyterian Church. St. James Presbyterian Church is in the village of Harlem in the city of New York, and we are grateful to bring with, to you our Bible study. Usually we have our Bible studies on Monday evenings, and there is a group of people that are with me. I was unable to broadcast for Bible study on Monday evening because I was doing another service for the Jewish holiday, Tisha B'Av. Um, with some great friends of mine where we were working on grief. So we're going to move forward with our Bible analysis today, and I'm going to share it with everyone, just in case you wanted to keep up with us about what it is that we're doing in our Bible study. So I'm going to share my screen um, so that we can work with the document that I've put together and hope that you will join me and join me in the prayer that is our psalm. Very often at St. James Presbyterian Church, we say that we would like to worship with open our worship with uh recording responding to the word and responding to the word is a presbyterian notion and so we start everything that we do with something that has to do with scripture and pray that god will guide our hearts in meditation to respond in kind here now psalm 111 psalm 111 verses 1 through 10 which is really just simply the entire psalm and before we get started, I want you to know that this is a hymn to God's great deeds. But it's part of a series of hymns. It's part of uh, a, a series of psalms that go together. Psalm 112 goes with this. It immediately follows, um, and it's paired with that. And Psalm 111 is a 22-line poem in which each line begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That's what we call an acrostic. Um, it's an acrostic psalm and there are many of those in the book of psalms psalm 111 praises the righteousness of the lord and psalm 112 the righteousness of a person living in accord with that divine righteousness so that's why they're paired together so here now psalm 111 as i share it with you today i will give thanks to the lord with my whole heart in the light of the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let's just take a little bit of a closer look at this particular psalm. As I mentioned to you before, this is a song that praises the righteousness of the Lord. But then it also does also move a little bit into the fact that we are witnesses to these great deeds and we study the great deeds of God so that we don't forget, so that we remember. God gains renown with all God's deeds, being gracious and merciful. But we also know that because of these wonderful deeds, some of the things that God does for us, we sort of don't think about as time moves forward. And that's why the psalmist reminds the people of Israel, he provides food for those who fear, who, those who fear him, being ever mindful of his covenant. And that is most likely referring to the manna and quail that God provided in the wilderness, Exodus 16, Numbers 11, and Psalm 104. 105 verse 40 that those who fear God God takes care of 
we'll move a little bit further into that notion of fear a little bit later. He is ever mindful of his covenant. One thing I want to stress about this particular psalm and many other psalms is that while we are beholden to praise God and we are beholden to do our part of holding the covenant with God, holding the promise that God, um, with promises of God that we are under grace, that we are under mercy, that we are forgiven, that we are God's people. It doesn't stem from us. It stems from the fact that God outlaid this covenant to care for us and that God is always mindful of his covenant. Many times we read our scriptures and I've had this conversation with someone just this past week and we wonder and we think about how come God is so angry and how come God is so violent in, in the First Testament and in other places. Part of it academically is because we are talking about a people who are writing their history to justify the fact that their God is on their side. Some of the pronouncements, but even regardless, irregardless of that, the notion that God is mindful to God's own covenant is what is in the minds of many of the people. Just remembering that everything that we can call out to as our blessing as a people of Israel is because God is mindful of God's covenant. You are my people and I am your God. This never falters and never wavers with God. We get punished, maybe. Uh, the people of Israel go into, uh, they go into um, exile, but that exile is for what reason? At least in terms of the literature, the exile is in direct response to the people not being mindful of the covenant in which they are in with God. The one that God has said, I need you to promise that you will be a part of this covenant. The separation from God and people are very often when we aren't being mindful of the covenant. Covenant is a contract. And when we are in contracts and someone doesn't follow the terms of the contract, what do we do? We either make that contract null and void. We either go to renegotiate the terms of that contract. Or we call someone out and say, you have not been true to your terms that you signed, that you promised to. And so therefore, there is something that you need to pay me because you did not follow through with you're part of the covenant. You're part of the contract. These are words I'm speaking, but I, as we go through all of our texts, and as you go through in your own reading, be mindful that this word covenant is not just this spiritual notion of, well, God is there and God has promised, but it is a contract that God is in with us out of joy and out of love and the pain that comes when we are not mindful of it. We feel the pain when we think that God isn't being mindful of the contract to us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We feel that pain. Imagine that same spiritual pain when the covenant has not been kept, the terms of the covenant. So hold that um, in your mindset as we go through our text. And as we go through the power of how God is calling the folks in our other texts to stay with the covenant and stay within the covenant. God has given the people the heritage of the nations. The work of God's hands are faithful and just. Now, this is where we move into a transition from admiring the divine deeds that start in verse 2, the second half of verse 2. And now we're being called to imitate the God who did those deeds. The works of God's hands are faithful and just. So must ours be. Therefore, we imitate God as we spoke about last week in our worship as well. All of God's precepts are trustworthy. Why? Because they have been established forever and ever. And 
all of those deeds and all of those creeds that we are imitating are to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. God has sent us redemption and commanded the covenant once again forever, the contract. Holy and awesome is the name of the one who stands to that contract and my, that contract that is being commanded should be held. Verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I often speak about this in community. One of my most informative moments that came from a young person who questioned me about the Psalms, maybe about 25 years ago, very quiet during the study. The child spoke up when they heard the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom and said that is why I don't like coming to church. That is why I don't like the Bible. Why do we have to fear the Lord? That's why I think it's important to understand the context and to understand the, the, multiple, the multiplicity of definitions that are available to us in the original languages, because this is best rendered as revering the Lord. Revering the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is in Psalm 19:9, Proverbs 1:7, 9, 10, etc., etc. Whenever you hear this word, the fear of the Lord, fear the Lord, revere, revere the Lord. In terms of the awesome nature of God, we are to be in awe. When we give up that idea that we know everything, that we have all knowledge, that awesome reverence is the beginning of wisdom that turns our eyes to the hills from whence comes our help, help as, it, as it may be, as it were. And it will begin, be the beginning of those who have good understanding as we practice wisdom and grow in wisdom. And as we grow in wisdom, we have reason to praise and praise and praise. I brought up a few points here in this particular text and just want you to think about them. Some of them are my notions, um, specifically as a, as a pastor. Others are those that I've taken from the uh, annotated Oxford version um, of, the, of the Bible, the NRSV. And others are just prayerful wonderings and questions for you to think about, to expand your meditation and your way of being with God. So read this psalm again and keep in mind some of the things I'm talking about, revering the Lord, the contract and the covenant that we have with God, that God has with us first and foremost. Our first reading for this Sunday, the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time, is 1 Kings. The second chapter, verses 10 through 12, and then the third chapter, verses 3 through 14. And just remember a few weeks ago in our lectionary texts, Nathan the prophet confronted David and told him a, a story, a parable, as it were, about a man, a rich man who stole the sheep of a man who loved his sheep, a poor man who loved that sheep very much because he didn't feel like killing his own. And David got very upset and said, this rich man needs to be punished. And Nathan said, that man is you because of what happened with Bathsheba and the killing of Uriah at David's command and letting him die on the battlefield and then taking his wife after having an adulterous affair with her. David confesses to the Lord, I have sinned against God. And God says to him, your family and your household will suffer. The monarchy will stay within your family, but you will see all that you've done in the dark, I will bring out and do in the light. And so there are a series of tragedies that happen to David's family. His brother, his, his, one of his sons rapes one of his daughters. The other son, kills that brother. 
that son Absalom also wages war against his father to take the throne and separates Israel north and south once again, the one that David had already brought back together underneath the split, the split that had occurred with Saul. And now last week, we have Absalom being killed and David mourning and moaning and moaning. Oh, my son. Oh, my son, Absalom. So he has heard God's word, has suffered under God's pronouncement of his punishment, but God has still kept God's own promise with him. And we'll read about that with his son Solomon. Then David slept with the ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. And so Solomon sat on the throne of his father David and his kingdom was firmly established. And then we move to chapter three, verses three through 13. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. A Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God asked, what should I give you? And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David although I am only a child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous that they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. Who can govern this, your great people? And it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. What a blessing. Mm. I will also give you what you have not asked both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked. Then I will lengthen your life. Mm. What a blessing. Usually when I do these studies on my own, I don't read them out loud before I bring them to you, but reading them out loud, my goodness. So here we have 
Solomon's kingdom firmly established. After we read about David's passing and the throne being passed on to Solomon, there's an entire introduction of, of Solomon's share about his wisdom. And, but the introduction to Solomon shares how his kingdom is established by violence. That chapter two, the rest of the chapter two, there's many battles and much violence that goes on in there. However, the author does not evaluate the violence that is the, the foundation of his kingdom negatively. Why is that? In our 20th, 21st century mindset, we sometimes have issue, take issue of the violence and the violence that seems to be sanctioned. Um, and such may be the case here with Solomon. But let's go back to this time period where Solomon is living. Think about the nations around him, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persians, and um, all of those other in the near Far East. Historically, as for this region, the time and the context, and comparatively, Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians, their annals, their stories of history, tell similar stories about the rise to power of important kings. If you remember way back when the people of Israel said that they wanted a king, and God told Samuel, and also told the prophets, it's not against you. It's really, they're claiming that they want leadership that they can't fathom that I'm actually have been giving and will give. So they want a king to be like everybody else. They want to keep up with the, the Joneses, as it were, in the Near East. And God said, their kings won't be like your kings, but there is already an established civil, in terms of civilization, this notion of conquering and violence to establish your power and your sense of who your nation state is. So if your nation state as an Assyrian goes before you as one who wins battles through all the violence, it will lead and go before you as the name of who you are as a powerful country, Babylonia. Babylon, I mean, and Persia, the same. And so now we have in this pantheon, part of the language of that, which is mostly used in our New Testament text, in the pantheon of countries and the pantheon of power in the Near East, this has Israel on par with all of those who are around them because their important king now also has established his kingdom by violence. So it's not looked at negatively because it is it places the entire nation of Israel now within the, the sphere of being a powerful nation among all the other nations that surround them. So there's a contextual notion to that that I wanted to, I wanted to share with you as well. So when we talk about Solomon loving the Lord as we move past that, and now we start to get into chapter three, here we have this wisdom portraying a more positive image of Solomon than in the previous chapter. We are now recharacterizing this King Solomon and sort of giving him a makeover from the second chapter and his first uh, our first entrance of him, uh, the, his first entrance of being the king, we're now giving him a makeover, a makeover of one being in good relationship with God, of one who is walking in wisdom. So we have this new positive image of Solomon internally, internally of the country, and internally in terms of how the history is woven into the theology of the people of Israel. Internally, this king now has a relationship with God. That doesn't matter for those people out there. What matters out on the outside of the Near East, in the Near East is that their king is a powerful king 
who has won battles. What matters on the inside is that their king is not only a powerful king that has won battles, but their king is one that has a deep relationship with God. So now we have him walking in the statutes of his father. We go back to that two, two through four. David's charge to Solomon is to walk within the statutes that have been placed before you. Here in these high places, there is, there will be some confusion to clear up because most of the, the literature that we read and we talk about worshiping God happens in the temple, happens in Jerusalem. They are in Jerusalem, but here we're hearing that he is in Gibeon offering sacrifice and, and offering incense to God at this high place. So the people and Solomon, in contradiction to Deuteronomic law and Deuteronomy 12, worship Yahweh in these quote unquote high places, which are local open air sanctuaries, but mostly they are condemned as idolatrous. Like the other nations are worshiping their gods and their idols. This model of worship is later looked at as idolatrous because Solomon here is exonerated. Why? Because the temple of God, of the God of Israel, the only legitimate eyes, only the legitimate temple in the eyes of the Deuteronomists has not even been built yet. Why? Who builds that temple? It is Solomon who builds that temple. So part of his worshiping and sacrificing in high places um, also feeds into part of the reason why he is able to understand it, how important it is for God to have God's own place, right? Verses four through 15, there's a divine vision. Along with that in 1 Kings chapter nine, uh, verses one through nine, it organizes the story of Solomon's rule into two parts. And chapter three here, chapter three, verse four through chapter eight, 66, we have a relation of, of Solomon's rule that is mostly the positive aspects of his reign, which culminates in said same building of the temple. Starting about 9, 10 to 11, 43, it relates Solomon's problematic behavior, which led to disaster. So at first we have this incredible, wise and um, rich king who has many, many women that he's married to or the women that are in his palace he loves and that he is a good king. And then after the temple is built, his purpose, his theological purpose, um, sort of spent in that the aspirational pur purpose of the king doing what the king does for God, the human once again starts to visit and his problematic behavior leads to disaster. Now, just to answer a question that was also posed to me um, and persons looking at this text this week, what is it that these kings get led to disaster. What, what is it that made David, who was this beloved of God, what is it that made him have an affair with this woman that he looked out and saw over his, on his roof, that he killed him, her husband? What is it about Saul that made him go so crazy and go against God that God had to sort of say, you are no longer the chosen one for me. What is it about these kings that are of God that God has these great relationships with? What is it about them that causes problematic behavior that leads to disaster? Could it be the lesson that we learn is that just because we're blessed by God does not mean we're any less human. We cannot rest on the laurels of our salvation. We cannot rest on the laurels of our blessing. 
we must be humble because our human nature is always at play. And just for these kings, what is that saying that we have in our culture? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's great wisdom, I think, when we look at this text and we, when I'm talking about this in terms of the context of, uh, of these kings sort of finding so much power and misusing it um, and stepping away from their aspirational promises uh, to God and as God's chosen. When we in America decided to do term limits for our presidents, I believe part of that is grounded in this particular notion that all of these kings, whether or not they believed they were chosen by God, even if they weren't, if they were doing things that were right to lead the community, all of a sudden there's this switch that gets turned on if someone's not there to say, keep your hand off that switch. In terms of the presidency of the United States of America, I believe that model in a two-term president is aspirationally trying to get us to that point. When you get a third term or a fourth term, your humanity and your, your access to that power um, seems to get the best of you. So let us be, a, let this be our reminder in our text. I'm not talking about current politic, political situation. You can take from it what you will, but there is a wisdom to recognize that we can learn from the fact that even these leaders that were chosen by God at one point in their careers, the humanity took over and led to disaster for the nation state. So we keep our eyes out. And why? Why is it? Look at the things that he is called to be. Steadfast in love. God is steadfast in love to the servant and steadfast to us. But what is he called to do? He's called to walk in faithfulness, called to walk in righteousness, called to work, walk in the uprightness of heart towards God. The oaths that many people take, they stop, for, they keep forgetting what they have promised. And that is the hard truth stands fast. Gibeon. Gibeon is about six miles north northwest or 10 kilometers north northwest of jerusalem it was an important religious and political center during the monarchy remember these places that we're talking about become political centers religio political centers we have a separation of church and state ostensibly in our mindset of what government and culture should be that was not the case so whenever we talk about any kind of a religious center, be it the northern, um, when, the, when, the, when Israel splits, the northern uh, part of the country sort of worshiping on the mountain and Samaria being the capital, the capital, that holds a political sway throughout all of our reading. Gibeon is a political and religious center during the monarchy. Solomon honors the place by seeking there through sacrifices, and I love this, I love the new term, and incubation dream, uh, through sacrifices and through um, incubation dreaming. Dream incubation is learning to plant the seed for a specific dream topic to occur. Therefore, it's looked at as a divine oracle. This place is a divine oracle at the beginning of this region of his reign. I want you to hear the mysticism that is also a part of this. How do you contact God when God is not in the temple? You go to a holy place and 
he is manifesting in his dreams. This dream incubation is something that is being done even now. If you, if you go online and Google dream incubation, you will see that there are methodologies that talk about how we manifest the things in our lives by resting and closing our eyes and focusing on that topic to see how that might play out in our dreams and then waking up and coming to live them out. This was the, the kind of mysticism that Solomon was doing when he went to Gibeon as well. This dream incubation, the sacrifices so that his mind could be opened and so that God would be pleased to speak to him in his dreams. Because think about it. How many times in our scriptures up until this point has God spoken to people in dreams? And how many times will God later speak to people in dreams as well? So this is a practice that is happening at Gibeon. So here God tests Solomon. Rather than just being able to divine after Offering a, offering a thousand burnt offerings, so on and so forth in this dream incubation. The Lord appeared to Solomon, where? In a dream by night, this incubation. How do I rule? We wonder what is the request that Solomon may have had for God to visit and for this dream to occur, help me to rule. I know that I've won all these battles. How do I lead the people? Leading the people is different than leading soldiers on a battlefield. I don't know what to do now that my father is gone. So God says, and what, just ask, what should I give you? What should I give you? And God tests Solomon here in verses five through nine, believes and he behaves rightly because he asked for wisdom in order to achieve his royal task. His wisdom is related to the task for which God has chosen him. And that is why God is pleased. And God is pleased when we discern that for which God is calling us. And our prayer is God, show me how to lead. Show me how you want me to be and the gifts that you have placed on me. That's why I always talk about in community, what are your, what are your gifts? How are your gifts growing? Are you discerning your gifts in terms of how God is working in your life? And then are we asking God, what do I do with those gifts? For your people. Here we have a model of that as well, because we are but children, not children in our age, <laughs> unfortunately. And that is not a negative thing either. I mean, I very often when I read these some of these texts and I read some of the language as you'll hear me say right now. Um, and now, Lord, my God, you have made me the servant and place of my father, David, although I am a little child. I do not go, know how to go out or go in. We hinted at it with David, where it says that David was small and ruddy. And sometimes that word small means that he was just the youngest of the seven or eight, depending on um, which book you're reading about how many sons um, his father had. But Solomon's presentation to God as a child or a little boy is this conventional expression, and the commentator says, of incapacity. Um, I put a note in this word as a word of the commentator. Um, and it always irks me, it rubs me the wrong way, not irks me. And is a problem for me, it's problematic to assume that children cannot have wisdom. So therefore, if he is incapacitated and he is feeling like a child, then it means the way that sometimes it plays out is that like, well, all children are, are, are ignorant and need, do not have wisdom and cannot be spoken to, to to garner wisdom from them. But personally, I think that I would like to hold that when I say I am only a little child, I want to intone with my God that more 
of a sense of innocence and humility. I am innocent and I am humble because I do not know how to go out or go in. Jeremiah says it in Jeremiah um, 16. Jeremiah says, I uh, forget the chapter, but he says, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. I think it's chapter 1, because that is Jeremiah's response to being called by God, meaning that I just don't have the words. I just don't have the articulation of it. But you've called me because you know I'm worthy. That's what I mean about this. I don't want it to be seen like, I don't want it to be thought of as a person is has the incapacity to be able to do what God has called them to do. God calls you because you are very capable. Hear what I said again. God calls you because you are very capable. But we pray God not take away the word but. God calls us because we're capable. And we pray that in our innocence and humility that God will show us how to go in and how to go out and how to use the gift that God has now made us aware that God is activating in us. I hope you hear that. I do not know how to go out and go in concerns military experience in the Bible. Numbers 27, 15 through 17, Moses spoke to the Lord saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint someone over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like a sheep without a shepherd. That's intoning that idea. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And it's interesting that the second generation, the next generation from David, next generation removed from the shepherd is saying, I don't know how to be a shepherd. What happened between generations? And then in this verse 21, Moses instructed, um, was instructed to appoint Joshua um, in, number, in Numbers, I believe it is as well, 21b. Moses instructed, uh, it says, um, at his word they shall go out and at his word they shall come in both he and all the Israelites with him, the whole congregation. And the distinction that is important here as part of Joshua's blessing is to do the battles necessary to take the promised land, to go in and to go out. Give your servant an understanding mind to govern your people, to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this great people? It sounds a little bit like Moses. Lord, who can answer all these people? Go get 70 elders. <laughs> Verses 10 through 13, God is pleased by Solomon's quest for wisdom and not for long life. It's um, attested to and affirmed in Psalm 21.5. His glory is great through your help. Splendor Splendor and majesty you bestow on him, or victory against his foes, all those other things that are given to him that he does not ask for. Um, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, at the, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them like pieces in a potter's vessel. And both these scriptures, God shows that God has the ability to grant both. But Solomon pleases God by asking for neither. But God prom also promises Solomon outstanding wealth. And both the themes, long life and victory, are developed in what follows in the rest of the account up till chapter 9 and the reign of Solomon. We move forward. I move forward. I give you what you asked and what you have not asked. Um, if, if you will walk in my ways, remember that covenant. The divine promise is offered continually here with a Deuteronomistic vocabulary and theology. And the book of Deuteronomy, you will continually hear that language, keep my statutes, walk in my ways, and I will. You must do this, do this, do this, and then I will. That is a 
De Deuteronomistic um, vocabulary and theology, the king must obey the divine law. But if we also look in 1 Kings 6, 11 through 13, God will even interrupt the speech of Solomon about how to build the temple. He's giving him all these instructions to build the temple. And then God says, but wait a minute, I insist that the divine presence will only inhabit this sanctuary, no matter where, if you follow it to my building instructions and my architectural plans to a T, I'm only going to inhabit the sanctuary if you observe the divine commandments. If you, um, if you observe the precepts, if you observe the law, if you keep your part of the covenant of our contract. Now, although the nation state among nation states has established itself and Solomon has established himself um, among those nation states and as the king and leader of those in Israel, this section that we've read sets him out theologically and sets him out in the religious history of Israel as the leader and the king and the rightful heir to David. The promise of God's promise. He is the living promise of God's promise to David. Even though your children will disobey, I will deal with them accordingly, but if the monarchy shall stay in your family. And here this is established in the history of Israel. So there are two notions, the notion of the history um, outside from the way that the world looks at, at Israel to now it is being affirmed and confirmed on the inside according to their precepts, their cultures, and the religion, the, the, the religiosity that they claim in terms of how God is speaking and leading us and bringing to us the right people to lead us. Both are now affirmed um, with chapters one and two. We have a short reading in Ephesians, chapter five, verses 15 through 20. Be careful that, oh, actually this is a continuation of Paul from our past two weeks of lectionary text in Ephesians about how to live a good life and a righteous life. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit as you sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here I reiterate as I usually do, as for us to remember that Paul is talking to a community that he started that is having some issues. <laughs> and so he is just reminding them of how they need to be with God and how they need to be with one another. They start to stray. Same thing happens in Galatians. Same, things happen, same thing happens in Corinthians, both one and two. People start to stray away, so Paul has to address the issues that have been brought to him. Being careful how you live in our translation, in the English translation, translation in the Revised Standard Version, I just wanted to clear up just a little bit because there's not a lot of commentary for this, but I wanted you to know that be careful how you live literally means be careful how you walk. Peripatheic. Be careful how you walk. But the nuanced meaning of that and the definition behind how you walk for our purposes 
is present yourself. Hear me now. It's not about the individual as it is about the individual in the collective. Because if you are a member of a church and you are saying that I live this way and I live that way, and then you are living another way out in the world and you say, oh, but you need to come to my church. Why would I want to go to your church when I see you out at the club? And I don't, it's not that I'm saying that the club is bad. I'm, I don't judge that way. But many people will say, I saw what you were doing out there in the street the other day and I heard the language that you were using. So why am I going to go to your church if, if you're not living and walking in a way that how you're presenting yourself? The judgment is not coming from me, the pastor, and it's not judgment at all. What I am saying is to walk in the, as wise people in the world and presenting ourselves with the wisdom of Christ matters for people who are seeking. I don't really care what people think about me. I don't really care what people think about if what I'm doing is right or what I'm doing is wrong. But all I know is that when I'm presenting myself as one of Christ, I do my best. So be careful how you present yourself. Not to justify your actions, not to justify so that you won't be judged, not to say I'll tell other people how they need to be in the world. But simply that if we are a member of a community of Christ followers, St. James Presbyterian Church, your home church, no matter where, where you call yourself a member of the community, how you present yourself matters. And so Paul wants the Ephesians to present themselves as wise people in their community at that time. Make the most of the time. Uh, you ain't got a lot of time. God's coming. This is his point. Jesus is coming. Remember always that Paul and the disciples and the apostles and most of these readings that we have in our in our scripture are all actively waiting for Jesus to walk back through the door. That's something to always remember. Be careful how you how you present yourself. Because the days are evil and the days are numbered. And as you are walking down the street, Christ may come. Do not be foolish but understand the will of the Lord, foolish. Wisdom dissipates. I'm gonna go back to this, this other one. Uh, verse eight, and then go back to that. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery. It is very clear in our English translation what this says. Um, people say, well, why do Episcopals, why do Presbyterians, why do Catholic people, why do this religious group, why do they drink wine, why do they do this, blah, blah, blah. It says for that is debauchery. The Greek interlinear, when you look at the exact language of the Greek for this, it says, and I'm not saying that, I'm not telling you that you need to go out and get drunk tonight. What I am saying is that the, the language is this, and do not become drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Not that it is debauchery. The language is not debauchery. Debauchery is a, is a definition that is thrown onto that word. Um, later in history, uh, very much after the, even the medieval time period. Um, I believe that's what Miriam said. Um, but Miriam loves, so we often define it as debauchery and read our own text as debauchery. So if you're doing this, then you are you are in debauchery. But Merriam-Webster helps us understand dissipation in a way. The action or process of dissipating, the state of being dissipated, a dispersion, diffusion, as in the dissipation of smoke. Like when you open your windows after your, after your smoke detector goes off because you're burning bacon in the other. Or the dissipation of enemy forces. Or an archaic definition 
the dissolution, disintegration, or this one, wasteful expenditure, the dissipation of a family's fortune, for example. You think about a wasteful um, expenditure, not just of money, but of time, of energy, intemperate living, it says, of course, excessive drinking, the act of self-indulgence, he lived a life of dissipation. So think about it in terms of self-indulgence, of wasteful expenditures, of energy, time, and money, disintegration and disillusion. Think about it in terms of this act of diffusion and dispersion. In this nuance of definition learned from Greek, I can also posit that it should read, or that we, sh we can understand it also is, is that getting drunk with, with wine leads to this dissipation. It confuses the mind, it helps us lose the focus. We don't keep our, our marbles in our head and they start to go away one by one because we are, our inebriation does not allow us to keep focus. People will often say that like, the devil made me do it when they're drunk because you lose and psychologically when we talk about the the appeal of some people drinking um, psychologically we know that your defenses are down that your judgment is off and i think that with that understanding of it um you can you can use this to say tell people not to drink or so on and so forth however i also think it's important to say do not lose the fact that um, your judgment, your ability to make correct decisions is lowered simply by, by drugs and alcohol. It's just the way that it is. By anything that, that makes our endorphins go, or makes our endorphins sort of spark and sort of gives us this sensibility of euphoria. Any of those things, if we're tempted with something, we some of us have a sense of bravado. Oh, I can get over that. I can, I can, I can not give into that. I'm good enough to not give into that. But what happens with many people, let's think about it in terms of drinking and driving. We all know now, and this wasn't the case 60 years ago, we all know now that drinking and driving is such a no-no, such a verbatim to do. And yet, one of the, I don't know if you all know this, but by the time someone usually, like the average amount of time that someone has driven while under the influence and driven inebriated, before they get their first DUI or their, before they get pulled over, is probably about 800 times. Now that's looking at all the large numbers of people, but. It's not the first time that you've gotten behind the wheel when you get caught. Because how many, and when you get caught, when you don't get caught and you're in a bar, someone says, well, maybe you shouldn't drive home. Oh, I can, I'm fine, I can drive. This is the idea that I want us to have in mind about drinking and dissipation. Because I want you to understand that Paul is calling people to be a certain way in the world make right decisions, be of clear mind, be of clear thought, and just use the example of drinking and driving. And how many people have a bravado that says, I can drive, I'm fine. I can drive, I'm fine. The dissipation of your common sense also drowns out your ability to be filled with the spirit. So hold on to that as we think about this um, and try and meditate on this to expand it for how we may have heard it and how we may have heard it preached and how we may have heard it spoken to about us in our lives. Not that anything that was spoken before is not true to heart and helpful for folks, but there is an expansion of this idea of being drunk, not even with wine, but in other ways dissipates our judgment, dissipates our common sense, dissipates 
how we factor in what's right and wrong. So I want us to hold on to that because wisdom dissipates with drunkenness. The whole idea that you see Paul puts this together, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise people. It may seem the most of your time because the days of the eve are, are evil. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk for wine, that is debauchery. Usually when we see these lists of licentiousness and drunkenness and blah, 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 it's a list of things. This one pops out. And I think it's to part of my personal way of thinking about things is that it is to punch up the fact that wisdom and you become unwise because wisdom dissipates with drunkenness, obscuring God's will. And because the days are evil, we must keep watch and we have to be on point. To say that, don't get drunk y'all, you ain't got time. <laughs> Jesus is coming. You don't have time for all of that. You have, you have to focus on understanding what the will of the Lord is. And you can do that through singing songs and hymns among yourselves and making melody to the Lord in your hearts and giving thanks. So I wanted to just speak on that a little bit since there wasn't a lot of extra and I had the time to. And there's not that much left with our Gospel of John. There's not, there's not much commentary on it. Um, but this is John 6, 51 through 58 is a much debated passage that may have the allusions to the Eucharist um, much more as it is played out in chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. The note, there's a little note, which is what that end means. But compared to the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, John's version of the meal does not include the words of institution. This is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which has been shed for you. These words of institution are part of our Eucharistic, our communion liturgy. This Gospel of John does not have that. Um, so this text in and of itself is often used for that purpose. But the absence of the words of institution in the book of John questions um, Questions the, the, the degree of the Gospel of John's very interest even in the sacraments. The knowledge and the relationship with Christ that this knowledge that we have and the special relationship that John calls us to be in and the secret knowledge as we've been talking about, the Gnosticism, the things that are in parentheses that are not in the other books that we said, oh, so that's what's behind this. Um, It says that maybe perhaps this isn't that important. Remember, bread is also a symbol for the food that is always available um, as part of the kingdom of God. Um, I mentioned last week that um, the young girl, after she um, was raised up after the woman with the issue of blood, said, give her something to eat. It's an evidence that it's a symbolic evidence of the, of the kingdom of God. I am the kingdom of God that came down from heaven. Also, if you remember, this language also in this text, oh, I didn't even read this yet, I'm sorry. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat, this flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. 
So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forevermore. The bread that the ancestors ate, like the manna, um, saying when they died, they didn't have this promise of me being the one to bring them to live forever. You have it now. Bread also being the kingdom of God. Also, remember, um, I bring this up later on in my notes. We've spoken before about the relationship between the word logos and Sophia wisdom. Remember, Sophia, she was she who was with God in the beginning. Here in John, logos as the masculine is a companion of creation. But Sophia ends up speaking in wisdom literature, as we found last week, about the those who follow her. Um, those who, Sophia ends up speaking wisdom literature, literature about those who do not follow, because those are the ones who do not eat of her flesh. And let me just fix this note for you in case you replay this. Sophia ends up speaking in wisdom literature about those who will not eat of her flesh, but her flesh is wisdom. You must eat of this wisdom if you are to be, to have a fruitful life, to have a life with God, so on and so forth. And when you read Proverbs and you talk, you hear wisdom spoken of, we must partake of wisdom. We must ingest wisdom. We must be in wisdom and wisdom must be in us. And Jesus speaks of those who must eat of his wisdom and bread and drink of his blood, the true drink. Like I said, ingesting the wisdom of the word is how I want us to think about this. Ingesting the wisdom of the word. This argument that the these Jews, quote unquote, um, it was a, this language points to the Jews, those seeking to find fault to bring against Jesus, hearing his word as cannibalism. <laughs> and I made a little joke, not enough to go around for, at that. There's not even enough, right? But the fault here is that others read what Jesus is saying not in the context of the kingdom of God, but in the context of the ancient Greek hero cults that feature language about the consumption of a God, which as a foreign concept, this God veneration to which they apply legalistic and literal assumptions. This whole thing about ingesting the wisdom ingesting the spirit being inside of us, so on and so forth, gets very literal and gets very legalistic in this particular pericope. They, first and foremost, say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Yes, it's cannibalism, but it's also, oh, so he's trying to be like those Greek gods. He's trying to be like, He's trying to like raise up them himself because they're trying to find arguments about him. Remember, they're always looking for arguments with Jesus. Cannibalism, foreign practices. Thou shalt have no other God before me. How can you tell us to do that when that's what they do to their gods? That's idolatry. And Jesus very clearly, you know, admonishes and said, that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is this, and you need to listen to this. He could easily say, I'm not talking about my flesh, flesh. I'm not talking about my blood, blood. But he doesn't. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of, the Ma Son of Man, the one sent by God, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Unless you who do not believe 
Take in what God is presenting to you for your nourishment and for your living. You are dead. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, those who ingest the living water, those who ingest the, the full wisdom and, and breadth of God, have eternal life. I'll get you up on the last day. I will abide in you and you will abide in me. There is this sense in the book of John, and I love this phrase, um, you abide in me and I abide in you. Jesus is not separating himself from those who believe. He's talking about the perfect union of God and human and spirituality in my mindset. So it is not for me a notion of eating flesh and blood. It is ingesting the very makeup of what is designed, of what is divine to be with us and for us to be in it, for us to feed off of one another. Even when you take a piece of fruit or something that you're eating and you are ingesting it, even though it comes out of us in the end, <laughs> it lives in us. The nutrients live in us. The vitamins live in us. All of those things course throughout our system. And just because we believe them and it's after all of those things are withdrawn from that, the solid matter is gone. But the vitamins, the nutrients, all of that lives in our blood, lives in our cells. Eat of this and you will live. I want us to be a little bit more analogous because sometimes when we read this in terms of, if we read it literally or legalistically, we have a hard time fathoming it and we turn ourselves away from thinking about it. I just want us to have more ideas to be able to really think around what does it mean to truly ingest Christ? What does it mean to truly drink his blood? What does it mean to truly hold within us in all of our corpuscles, in all of our cells, in all of our neurons, the divine grace and blessing of God guiding us to be the people that God calls us to be by staying in the word, by praying, how does our entire being and spirit abide in Christ? And how can Christ abide in us? That to me seems like a more important question than fighting over whether or not it's literal to think about eating flesh and drinking blood. but ingesting wisdom and allowing wisdom to abide in us. Ah, there I are. I hope I've given you something to think about, something to hold on to. I also want you to know that if you disagree with anything that I've said, that is completely fine. Not that I'm giving you permission, but what I'm saying is no matter what I've said, no matter how we've spent this time together, I pray that it causes you to expand your interest, your vision of meditating on the word so that it may speak to you as I feel it speaks to me at times. I ask that God will bless you. I claim that God will keep you and I tell you to ingest wisdom. I tell you to pray for wisdom like Solomon. 
I tell you to look at the good deeds of God, as the psalmist said, and imitate them in the world. All of this I wish for you and more. As I say, holy and loving, gracious God. We thank you for this time that we've been able to spend in your word. We hope, oh God, that we may grow, that someone will find one word or a sentence or even a paragraph that matters to them or that sparks their thinking to say, how is God calling me to think about this text? We ask, oh God, that you would bless St. James Presbyterian Church, that those will go to our website and our email and our Facebook, and even to look on this Zoom and give us, our YouTube and give, our Facebook and give us comments and questions. But mostly, God, we ask that you would bless those who hear and bless those who are working with this scripture this week. We ask, oh God, that you bless those who are there, that if they do decide to share in the ministry of St. James Presbyterian Church and want to help support this Bible study ministry, that they will do so simply by going to PayPal and we bless those offerings. We ask that you keep us, love us and hold us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray.